Father, we come before you and we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Father, we thank you for who you are. And Lord, I just pray for your anointing, your blessing on the teaching this morning. God, that you would speak to each one of us. Father, we know we're living in some difficult and dangerous times. And Lord, until you take your church home, it could get a little worse. But we know that whoever is that wherever we are, that you are with us, God, and that you will protect us because we are your sons and daughters. So, Lord, go before us now. Bless our time. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, smartphones, iPads, whatever you have, I'm going to be sharing out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 to 20. And I titled the message, having joy in difficult and dangerous times. A.W. Tozer said, every soul belongs to God and exists by God's pleasure. God being who and what he is, and we being who and what we are. The only thinkable relation between us is one of full lordship on his part and complete submission on our part. We own every honor that is in our power to give him. And I say amen to that. You know, if this morning you're sincerely trying to live a godly life, I want you to know something if you don't know it already. We are going to suffer for Christ. It's just part of it. We are blessed to live in the United States of America. All the other countries around the world, I mean, Christians are being slaughtered, they're being killed, and we're here, you know, and it's, I, I think about this a lot. I never thought I'd see the age of 21. I was in the diamond lane, so to speak, with my life, and uh, here, here, month after next, I'm turning 70. I know you guys can hardly believe it, huh? Time goes so fast, and I'm thinking, you know what? The biggest part of my life is behind me, and I might have five, ten years, maybe fifteen if I'm blessed. But we're close. We're getting close. So Paul wrote to Timothy, his son in his faith, of his, in the faith, and he said in 2 Timothy 3:12, "Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution." So God has given us what we need to help us during unstable times like we're living in today. I mean, we don't know from one moment to the next what's gonna go on in our country or in the world. It's just so unstable. First of all, God has given us his word. Notice verse 13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. You know what's so amazing about God's word? The church was actually founded on it. And it's also that same word that brought salvation to us. It enables us to live for Christ. 
It enables us to endure what we continually deal with for his sake. You know, Paul brings out a couple of things here that help the believers in Thessalonica. I mean, they were struggling. And Paul wanted to share with them that we need to endure the times that we are living in. You know, if, if I was back in Paul's day, I think out of all the churches, I would have went to the church in Thessalonica. These guys all just poured out prophecy on them. And they got a grip on it. They got a hold of it. And I love it. It's something I've been studying since the mid-70s. And uh, just all these years, almost 50 years, studying prophecy and how the end days are, are going to wrap up. You know, I love the book of Revelation. I teach it a lot. I just talk with the CEOs that I'm pastoring on, online. And uh, we went through the book of Revelation. It really opened up their eyes. It was my ninth time teaching verse by verse through it. And I just love it. I see what's going on in the world. And I'm telling you guys, we're close. We are very close. I personally, I'm not a prophet or nothing, but I truly believe most of us, if not all of us, are going to be alive when that trumpet sounds and Christ comes to take us out of here. It's an exciting time that we're living in. Amen. First of all, they left God's word. We know the Bible is God's word. The Bible is inspired by God's spirit, as it was written by godly men who were used by the Holy Spirit. We see that in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 to 17, if you're taking notes, and 2 Peter 1, verses 20 to 21. Psalm 19, verses 7 to 9, just kind of lays it out for us. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. One thing I always encouraged my congregation, the church I had in California that I retired from, and God says, who do you think you are, Jonah? Get back in here, you gotta be teaching. <laughs> and so, one thing God always has encouraged me, and I encourage the believers, stay in God's word. Yeah. Read it on a daily basis. B-I-B-L-E, believers instructions before leaving earth, right? I mean, we need to be in the word. There's a saying, some of you might have heard it. A Bible that's falling apart, most likely belongs to someone who isn't. I love that. It leads to a heart-searching question. If you had to make a decision between your Bible and anyone or anything else, what would your decision be? You know, right away, I thought of Job. Listen to what Job said as he was stripped of everything he had and owned. And now let's believe Job according to our currency today, was worth about eight and a half million dollars back in them days. And he was stripped from everything. That's why he said, Job 23, verse 12, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. God's word. The writer of Psalm 119, said that God's word meant more to him than all riches, thousands of gold and silver, fine gold, and even great spoil. We read in Psalm 119, verse 148, my eyes, my eyes are awake through the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Just get in the word. I, the moment I get up, I've got to spend 30 minutes reading the word. I mean, you guys heard me share last time. I made a commitment back in 1981 to read through the Bible once a year. Genesis to Revelation. I do that every morning. I do four chapters every morning to make it through from January 1st to December 31st. The more you read, when, when you get in a distressful situation or something happens, 
the Holy Spirit just brings that word up to you. Just brings it up to help you to be able to deal with that. He enables you to endure whatever it is that you're going through. You know, it's interesting because the Jews had three night watches. Sunset to 10, 10 to 2, and 2 to sunrise. The psalmist is declaring he gave up sleep three times a night to spend time in God's Word. I love that. I want you to catch the principle here. If you want to be victorious, how many of you guys want to be victorious as Christians? Let me, let me see how many of you. Okay, some of you can raise your hands. You'll get to that place when we're at the end of the teaching. I'm just kidding. Mike told me, he says, I want you to look at it. Everybody who's here, let me know who didn't show up. So that's, why, that's why I'm standing in the room, okay? I'm just kidding. He didn't say that. I want you to catch the principle here. If you want to be victorious in difficult and dangerous times, you have to be in the Word of God. You have to be in God's Word. If you're not in the Word, I mean, it's, you, you can't make it. You can't make it. That's why the world turns to alcohol, drugs, and everything else to try to survive. We have God's Word. The second thing that helped the believers, the first one is they love God's Word. Secondly, they receive God's Word. Paul used two different words for receive. First means to accept from another, and the second means to welcome. One has to do with the hearing of the ears, the other has to do with the hearing of the heart. You see, believers didn't just hear the word, they took it to heart. They took it to heart and they made it a part of their daily lives. You know, I, I don't go to church on Sunday and then live like how I want through the week. The Lord's with me. I pray all the time. I made so many decisions in the past almost 70 years that I wish I had prayed and said, God, what, what do you want me to do in this situation? Which direction do you want me to take? Show me, Lord. Show me. And I'd get in the Word and God would reveal it to me what to do. I'm one of those spur of the moment guys. You guys know what I'm talking about? Spur of the moment. Hey, let's pull up and go through Dunkin' Donuts and get a mocha. <laughs> All right, let's go. <laughs> Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. That's why we need to look at our lives daily to see and make sure that we are really in the faith, that we are really living this faith out. You see, if we're not examining our lives, we're deceiving ourselves and we're thinking that we're okay. That everything within a walk is good when it's not. As a pastor, all the years of counseling, 27 years of pastoring, all the years of counseling, all I can do is warn people when I see them start to drift, when they start slipping. I mean, I, I wish I had something that I could just lock down with them in a room and with padded walls, you know. <laughs> Because I love these guys, and I see them drifting and going into areas and doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Well, it's up to them to make the necessary changes that they need to make if they want to continue in the right standing with God and allowing God to use them. I can't tell you how many brothers in Christ who were co-laborers in the trenches. Man, going to Russia on uh, missions, went to Australia, some of the other country, the Philippines. I mean, just missionary work, just in the trenches together, going to Israel. I mean, and now they're out hitting the bars again. They're all drinking. 
They lost their wives. They lost their children. Their children want nothing to do with them. And you know what I hear them tell me now? Rick, if I could only get back to where I was when I started drifting. I said, brother, you can't do that now. But you can pick up the pieces right now and start living for God in a way that will bring glory to Him. Because my God, our God, is a restorer. Amen. He can restore what the enemy has ripped us off. And I've seen it in our own personal lives. There is that possibility. We can be disqualified. I don't walk out of water. None of us do. Any one of us can start straying. That's why we have to be in the Word. We have to be in the Word. You know, all my life, I've, I've been a guy. I've, I've built hot rods, 30s and 40s vehicles and 60s. And I've always built ground up motorcycles and RVs. And I still ride a Harley now. I had to put training wheels on it. Baby. I'm still good. I still have it. I can hold it up. But I've done that all my life. And ever since my wife and I, Steph and I, got saved in 1981, when are all the car and bike shows? Saturday and Sunday. Or midweek, Wednesday night. You know what? I made a vow to God. God, you are always first in my life. Church is number one. Even if we have three daughters, grayer, <laughs> five granddaughters. <laughs> And it's like, you know what? We were at church. We were always at church. When it was one of the kids' birthdays, my, you know, our parents or family members, friends call us, hey, you guys having a birthday party? Yeah, we're going to have one. Well, it's going to be after church. We're going to church first, and then we'll have the whole afternoon eating. That's the way we've always lived our lives. Because God pulled me out of the gutter. I should have been shot and killed from the biker gangs that were after me, the street gangs. And you know what? God saved me. And it's like I'm never going back there. But be careful when you say that. Never say never. Because it's easy to go back. And it's the way we live our lives. If you would have told me back in 1981 I'd be a pastor, I'd say, man, there is no way. Get out of Dodge. You know, there's no way. Growing up in Detroit and just all the things I got into, God couldn't use me. He wouldn't use me. But you know what? God has a sense of humor. Here I am. <laughs> Here, I, Here we are. Amen? Amen. You know, I've learned through the years, anyone can profess faith in Jesus Christ. But Jesus said you were known by their fruit. What was he talking about? You will know them by their fruit. Well, what kind of life are they living? What's coming out of their mouth? What are their motives in doing what they claim to do in the name of Christ? You know, there's a story that's told of the devil having a meeting with his demons to decide how to persuade men that God was non-existent. Since they believed in his existence, they wondered just how to do it. One demon suggested they tell people Jesus never really existed and that all men should not believe such fiction. Another demon suggested they persuade men that death ends all and there is no need to worry about life after death. Finally, one demon stepped forward and he suggested they tell everyone there is a God. There is Jesus Christ. And that believing in him, you will be saved. But all you have to do is profess faith in Christ and go on living in sin. Man, that is the lie of our days. That is the lie of our days. I'm telling you, that's one of the devil's tactics. And man, I'm telling you, the dude uses it all the time. <laughs> he uses it today on us. Now you can go ahead. Hey, you're saved by grace. Do whatever you want to do. Paul nailed the church in Corinth. I mean, Corinth, the church in Corinth was the most horrific kind of people. I mean, anything goes with the people of Corinth. And when they got saved, they got fired up for the Lord, but they brought in their past with them. And Paul had to nail them. I said, what are you guys doing? 
And then the Gnostics came in, and they're teaching this superior knowledge after once you're saved, right? And Paul said they're false teachers. The Gnostics were teaching, look, because the flesh is going to go back to the earth, and the spirit is going to go to heaven, you can live however you want to live. Do whatever you want to do, because the flesh is going back. Paul said, because grace abounds, should we continue in sin? God forbid. God forbid. Jesus reportedly warned people about the wrong kind of hearing. He said in Matthew 13, verse 9, he who has ears, yeah, it looks like everybody has two ears. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus is actually saying, take heed that you hear, that you use every opportunity you have to hear the word of God. Jesus gave a second warning in Mark 24, uh, verse 24. He said, take heed what you hear. And then he gave a third warning in Luke 8, verse 18. Therefore, take heed how you hear. Let him hear, that you hear, what you hear, and how you hear. You know, we can get careless. We can get lazy. We can get to the place where we're not paying attention to apply what we hear as we sit before a teacher expounding God's word. We can do that. I had a couple guys in my congregation and they always sat right in front. They'd fall asleep in the middle of the service. It's like, are you kidding me? Sit in the back row, sinner's row, you know, in the back. <laughs> well, that's what they called it in the prisons. I did prison ministry for 15 years. And these guys would sit in the back row and boy, they'd mad dog me something fierce. I'm telling you, it's like, Dude, wait until you get outside the chapel here. You know? And I'm thinking, God, make it quick. You know, I'm a sissy. I hate pain. Make it fast. <laughs> we receive this word by understanding it. We receive it into our hearts. And we're to meditate on the word. You see, that's when it becomes a part of our lives. That's when it becomes a part of our lives. The third thing that helped the believers, they love the word, they receive the word, they apply God's word. As they obeyed the word of faith, guess what happened? God's word went to work in their lives. It went to work in their lives. A minister was talking to a man who professed being saved, and he asked, have you joined the church? No, I haven't, the man replied. The dying thief never joined the church, and he went to heaven. The minister asked, have you ever sat at the Lord's table? No, the dying thief never did, and he was accepted. The minister asked, have you been baptized? No, he said. The dying thief was never baptized, and he went to heaven. Have you given to God's work? No, the dying thief never did, and he wasn't judged for it. The disgusted minister said to the man, Well, my friend, the difference between the two of you, he was a dying thief and you're a living thief. <laughs> You'll get it on the way home. <laughs> Just professing faith in Christ, it's not evidence of saving faith. I mean, James, in the book of James, the Lord's half-brother, he even says the demons believe. In fact, they tremble. Faith without the fruit of faith is dead. That's what James was teaching. He wasn't teaching something contrary to what Paul. Paul was talking about faith in the law. James was talking about faith, the fruit of faith. The faith in works that comes from being saved. You know, as far as the world is concerned, it shows them that faith means nothing to us if they don't see us living by faith. Yeah. The world watches us. Yeah. They're watching you. Yeah. 
They're watching to see how you conduct yourself, how you act. And you know what? It's your life that's going to draw family members, friends, and neighbors to the Lord. Because they're going to watch how you handle things. Abraham. Abraham was justified by faith when he offered up his son Isaac. They're on Mount Moriah. Uh, most of you are familiar with uh, uh, Temple of Mount. They're in Jerusalem and the wall around it. Well, they go down. That's the Gentiles' temple. That's the mosque. And what's interesting about it, right next to it, was uh, is a flat area. And there's a little round thing. It's called the Dome of the Spirits. And when you when you go up to it and you look in it, you know there's nothing there or anything. Well. That is believed to be the highest part on Mount Moriah, right there. It's believed, the Jews believe, that's where Isaac uh, was going to be offered up to God by his dad Abraham. That's actually where the third temple is going to be built. There's going to be a walk put up between the two, and the tribulation temple is going to be there. I don't know if you guys are watching what's going on with that. They're, they're putting materials aside right now to build that temple. Did you guys see? How many of you saw their Messiah? They say this guy's the true Messiah. Did you guys see that on the news? They, they're saying he's working miracles. I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, Lord, cut it out. <laughs> cut it out, Lord. How close are we? Things are really rolling, man. It's exciting times. It's, it's heavy, hard times. But it's exciting for us as born again believers because we know that trumpet could blow at any time, man. It could blow at any time and we're out of here. Abraham's faith caused him to lift that knife to do something he never thought God would ever ask of him to do. But because God told him to kill his only son, Abraham was willing to do it. This is where faith comes in. Abraham believed if God would have him kill his son, Abraham believed by faith that God would resurrect his son. Right, right there on the spot. Remember the, the servants that came with Abraham and Isaac when they were taking the wood and the fire going up to Mount Moriah to offer up Isaac? What did Abraham say to the, the guys? He said, me and the lad are going to go worship him. Well, we will be back. I want that kind of faith. That's the kind of faith that I want. You think about that, the story there in Genesis chapter 22. You know Abraham never offered Isaac. God provided a substitute. There was a ram caught in the thickets. Here God told Abraham, the first Jew, to offer his son Isaac and kept him from doing it. And God did what he told Abraham. God offered up his only son for our sins so that we could believe in him by faith and go to heaven. Oswald Chambers said, Beware of worshiping Jesus as the Son of God and professing your faith in him as the Savior of the world while you blaspheme him by the complete evidence in your daily life that he is powerless to do anything in and through you. Lifestyle. It's, it's taking this word. It's, it's loving God's word. It's receiving God's word. And it's applying. When I hear the teachings being taught, I, I listen. You know, it's hard for me to hear another pastor teaching. Because I'm in, you know, I want to go on my phone and pull up my teaching on that, right? <laughs> and follow along. And it's like, God's just putting it on my heart. Will you stop it? You know, we get from each one of us what is being shared with us. God uses all of us. And it took me so long. You know, uh, March, this is March two years ago, is when we started fellowshipping here. And I think I finally stopped doing that just before Christmas. <laughs> last year and I realized that Mike's a good teacher <laughs> the second thing God has provided for us God has blessed us with other believers look at, look at verse 14 
He said, for you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea and Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same thing from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us. And they do not please God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, for wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. You know, people who continue to deal with things in their life can become self-centered. They can become self-centered. You know, it's easy to think you're the only one going through the fire. You ever, you ever think that? Whatever you're going through, it's like, you know, how come so and so? I mean, these guys go on vacation every week, they got a brand new car, and they're doing this and that, and how come I'm going through this? Every day something else is happening. You know, I'll admit, yes, things do bum us out at times. <laughs> we do get frustrated. But here's what we have to keep in mind other believers are going through the same things. We're all in this boat together. We're all going through it. Listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter 5, 9. He said, resist him, speaking of the devil, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. We, we all go through it. You know, how do you resist Satan? Well, Peter nailed it right here in the next couple of words. Steadfast in the faith steadfast in the faith as you study paul's writings you see how much paul loved his fellow jews i mean at one point he even said that he would give his life so that they would all go to heaven god called israel to be a blessing to all the world we see that when God was speaking to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, in verses 1 to 3. They were to be a blessing to the whole world. But then when Christ came, they rejected him, God's son. You know, when we're disobedient to God, he has to discipline us, right? As his sons and daughters. That was such a horrific thing to reject Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as their Messiah, that in 70 AD, when Titus led the Roman army in, burnt down the city and the temple, the Jews split. And for 2,000 years, they were scattered until May 14, 1948, when they went before the United Nations in New York City and declared their sovereignty again as a nation. Jesus told us in Matthew 24, the parable of the fig tree. The first time the fig tree is mentioned is Judges chapter 7, I believe, or 9, 7 or 9. But it speaks of the children of Israel, the Jewish people. Jesus gave the parable of the fig tree. He said that generation would not perish till everything's fulfilled. Guys, according to God's word, we are that generation. I mean, how long? They've been in the land now, what, 70 some years? I don't know how long a generation is, but I know we're close. I know we're close. And it just encourages me to keep living for the Lord. You see, the problem was the Jews couldn't see their law was something temporary. It was temporary. Everything in the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi, it's all a foreshadowing and a picture of the New Testament, what Jesus was going to say and do. Everything. In, in, when, when we did a teaching through Exodus, and you have all the articles in the temple there, it's amazing. It all spoke of Christ. Especially the mercy seat behind the veil, the holiest of holies, on the Ark of the Covenant. The, the high priest that year would have to make atonement for himself, they would tie a rope around his ankle. He'd have belts under his robe just in case he had sin in his life. If they didn't hear the bells, amen, pull Joseph out. You know, and they'd have to pull him out. 
because God's a holy God. So he would take that blood of an animal, pull back behind the veil, sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat. Guess what that mercy seat represented? Jesus Christ and his atonement. He would make it the New Testament of shedding his blood for mankind. It's incredible when, when you see the whole picture of it as you're reading through the word. It was temporary for God's new covenant of grace. So they rejected God's truth to protect their man-made traditions. According to verse 16, Paul says Israel was filling up their sins and storing up wrath for the day of judgment. You see, God patiently waits for us. I praise God. I never thought I'd see the age of 2021. 20, I never did. I was way, way too far gone. And you know, when I turned 27, I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. And he patiently waited for me. How many of us has he waited? All those years. Just the hardness of our hearts and our heads. And finally, one day, it's like someone put a light on I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to live for him. I want to be eternity in heaven with him and what he's been preparing for us. Even as we continue to rebel against him, he watches as our measure of sin and judgment slowly fills up. And when the time is up, God's patience ends. He pulls the plug judgment falls. Praise God we're saved. Praise God we are born again believers. Third and last thing God has provided for us, God has given us the hope of being in his presence. Look at verse 17. But we, brethren, have been taken away from you for a short time in presence, and in heart, not in heart. Endeavor more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we want to come to you. Even I fall time and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. I love that. That word hindered from the original Greek Aramaic text in the New Testament in verse 18 merely means this breaking up the road and putting up obstacles. That's what Satan does. The path we're on, he wants to break up the road and put up obstacles. That's where we hold on to God. That's where we got our hand in the hand from the man from Galilee, as the song went. <laughs> I grew up in Detroit, it's all about Motown. I love Motown music. <laughs> What I love about Paul is he looked ahead by faith. This is what we all need to be doing. He looked ahead by faith and he saw these believers in the presence of the Lord. He said, we're gonna meet all again on the, on the other side. In times of difficulty, in times of danger, guys, we gotta look to the future. We have to look to the future because for you and me as believers, that's where our hope lies. Paul lived his life by knowing what God was going to do in the future. That's how he lived his life. I mean, just the fact that we will stand at Christ's judgment seat, at the beam of seat of Christ to be rewarded. Now I've had believers ask me, well, wait a minute, Rick. Christ died on the cross for my sins. You mean we have to be judged again? No, this is a different judgment. What he did on the cross and when you receive that, it's a done deal. It's gone, it's over. You'll be never brought up again. It's finished. Yes, you will. It's the only Spanish I know. <laughs> but there at the Bema seat, we are gonna be rewarded for what we did as Christians from our heart. What was the motive behind our heart and things that we were doing? There's crowns involved. 
Paul saw these rewards as crowns. You know there's five crowns that we could actually receive? Did you guys know that? Let me go over them real quick. The first one is here in verse 19. The crown of rejoicing. The crown is the victor's crown that one would receive at the games that they had back in uh, Paul's day in the culture. It's the word Stephanos, where we get the name Stephen and Stephanie. That means when I married my wife Stephanie, I got a crown right away. <laughs> An earthly crown, but a good one. <laughs> so Paul said these believers would be his crown when he met them at the judgment seat of Christ. One of my favorite, many favorite scriptures is Daniel 12, verse 3. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Saving souls, reaching out souls. Secondly, the imperishable crown. The imperishable crown is for the believer who disciplines his body who disciplines his body and you keep it in control for God's glory. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, 27. The third one is a crown of life. We receive it for endurance. Remember Jesus said he who endures to the end will be saved. This is a long run, it's a long haul. You know, I, I don't just come Sunday and do my Sunday thing and then however I want to live all week long. We see that in Revelation 2.10, Jesus said, and then James 1.12. The fourth one is the crown of righteousness. I love the crown of righteousness. This is a crown you can receive, attain, just by looking for the Lord's appearing. Just by looking for his appearing at the rapture when he comes for his church. 2 Timothy 4.8. The fifth one is the crown of glory. Now that's for the pastor, elder, teacher who is faithful. First Peter 5, verses 1 and 4. You know what's amazing about these crowns? I totally believe in God's grace. He's going to give us these rewards, these crowns, so that we can just give them back to him. Now you're probably thinking, okay, Rick, what are you talking about? Well, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, and verses 9 to 11, it says this. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes and crowns of gold on their heads. These symbolize the church. This is what it says. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, who's going to be on the throne, judgment? during the tribulation, Jesus. Because he was rejected, he's now become the judge. Who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And here it is, they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you have created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Now let me just say this. We know these elders are not angels. We know that because according to Hebrews 12, verse 22, angels are not numbered, neither are they crowned or enthroned. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 11, the elders are distinguished from the angels and the crowns that they're wearing are the victor's crowns, Stephanos. In fact, there's no scriptural teaching that angels receive rewards. It's interesting in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, Daniel got a glimpse and he saw those thrones and they were empty. Check it out. The apostle John sees them now and they're filled. They're filled. I can't even imagine what was going through John's mind as he was in heaven watching all this take place. It's significant. John wrote the book of Revelation because of the severe persecution the Christians were going through. They were being persecuted. 
So here we have the crowns of the church laid at Jesus' feet as an act of submission and worship because he's the only one who is worthy. The living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne as they worship him for his attributes because of who he is. But when it comes to the 24 elders representing the church, they worship not only because of his attributes, but they're worshiping because of what he's done. He died for us. He gave his life so that we could have life, so that we could live. You see, the, the people in the church of Thessalonica, they were tempted to give up. They were ready to throw in the towel. But Paul tells them the same thing I'm going to tell you guys this morning. Hang tight. Hang tight because the future is where our hope lies. It's all about the future. 1 Corinthians 2 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. When we get to heaven, it's going to have been worth it. It's going to be worth it. Because we are going to experience all eternity, not only getting to know our Lord better, but seeing what he has prepared for us. Every day is going to be like going to Disneyland. Well, when Disneyland was good and cheap, right? <laughs> Before it went south. I want to finish with this story. And this isn't about Pastor Mike, okay? Or me, or Eric. One Saturday night, a pastor said to himself, there's no way I can face that congregation tomorrow. I'm going golfing. So he phoned his assistant and told him he wasn't feeling well and wouldn't be at church. Then the pastor got up very early that Sunday morning, drove out to the local course, up in heaven, St. Peter nudged God and said, You see your servant down there, Lord? You see what he's doing? God replied, Mm-hmm. Why well, aren't you going to do anything about him? God replied, Don't worry. The truant pastor was the first one to tee that morning. He teed up his ball, took a swing, and oh my, what a shot. It was the best drive he'd ever hit. As he watched with disbelief and joy, the ball bounced high on the apron, rode on the green down to the flag. The pastor ran over to the green to find the ball in the cup, his very first hole in one. He hopped and danced around the green. He was all excited. Meanwhile, St. Peter asked the Lord, God, I thought you were going to take care of this guy. Now he's gone and gotten a hole in one. God replied, I did take care of him. Who do you think he's going to tell? <laughs> <laughs> You'll get that one on the way home too. Back to back. <laughs> I love it. God has a sense of humor. I mean, look at us, right? He has a sense of humor. He loves us so much. Well, <clears throat> I want to go ahead and pray us all. Let's pray. Father, we do come before you and we thank you for your word. God, it's your word that brings life to us. It's our strength. It's our encouragement every morning as we get up. Because we don't know what we're going to come against through the course of the day. So, Lord, I pray for all my family here. God, that you would... Place on their hearts to spend as much time as they can in your word and with you. Your desire is that we commune with you. You want us to commune through prayer and in the study and the teaching of your word. And God, I pray if there's anyone here this morning that might know you, they may have known you all their lives, but they have never publicly prayed and asked for forgiveness of their sins pray to you and become a born-again believer and have you, Father, send the Holy Spirit to live and dwell inside of them 
for the rest of their life. The Holy Spirit is our seal until the day of redemption, but it also enables us. The Holy Spirit enables us to be able to live the kind of life that is pleasing to you, Father. If there's anybody here, as you are all praying, and you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, maybe you knew him your whole life, been in church your whole life, but you have never prayed and asked God to forgive you for your sins. And this morning, God is tugging on your heart and saying, you know what, Greg? I want to pray. I want to make it official. I want to commit my life to Jesus Christ. If that's any of you here this morning, I want you to raise your hand and I'll pray for you before we close. Anybody here? It's between you and God. All right. God bless you. Anybody else? As God is speaking in your heart, I'm telling you, time is short. We're near. We don't know how many more times we're going to have an altar call given and an opportunity to respond. I don't want to see anybody left behind. I want us all to go home. I'll go be with Jesus. Anybody else before we close here? Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Anybody else? Amen. I'm going to, with these few that raise their hands, I'm going to ask all of you to pray this prayer with me out loud. Let's encourage them. Let's pray this out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe you died for my sin. And on the third day, you rose from the dead. Lord, I believe you're alive. I believe you're coming back soon. Forgive me of all my sin. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. I surrender my life to you, Lord. Use me for your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God.